Major funding for Odyssey was provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Additional funding was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And Polaroid. In the kingdoms and fiefdoms of Europe, it was called the year of our Lord, 1150. No one knows what the year was called here, or if it was called anything at all. In Europe in 1150 AD, the people lived in wooden hovels and isolated villages and towns. Here in that same year, the finishing touches were being put to some of the most spectacular masonry buildings ever constructed by man integrated townships with places of worship and work, debate and play. This is the most famous of those townships, Pueblo Benito, beautiful town, the name given it by its discoverers more than 600 years after its people abandoned it in the territory that was to become New Mexico. Its people's own name for themselves, their townships, their land, we will never know. Pueblo Benito is just one of a dozen large buildings in a shallow canyon, 15 miles long and a mile or so across, Chaco Canyon. Yet the people of Chaco spread far beyond the canyon itself, holding sway over a region of 40,000 square miles establishing perhaps a hundred outlying townships linked by skillfully engineered roads and a system of long-distance communication. All this 800 years ago, in an environment so arid it supports almost no one today. The full achievement of the Chaco people is only now being appreciated by archaeologists. We're trying to understand how and why such an astonishing culture flowered in the deserts of the Southwest, and why abruptly it faded and disappeared. Chaco Canyon is in the Four Corners area, where New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, and Utah meet. It lies at the center of the shallow San Juan Basin. Across the basin runs, very intermittently, the Chaco Wash, which is cut through a sandstone mesa to create Chaco Canyon. Dominating the landscape is its aridity. The canyon itself is a relative oasis. In about 500 AD, it attracted wandering desert dwellers from the north, people who fed themselves mainly by hunting and gathering on the mesa tops, but who also planted corn, beans, and squash in the more watered canyon below. One of these groups settled here, Arizona State Museum's Gwyn Vivian. This is Shabikashi Village. It was built about 1,500 years ago by a group of people who moved into the area from the north. They built pit houses, such as this structure here, and began by excavating a pit into the ground. They not only excavated the primary living pit, but excavated an antechamber pit as well. After the area was excavated approximately three feet into the surface, and these dwellings were about 12 to 20 feet across, slabs of sandstone that would have been collected from the cliff edge would have been placed along the edges of the pit to form a wall. The sandstone slabs also lined the antechamber, which served both as a storage area for food and as an entrance. Four posts supported a beam roof. Over the beams was piled soft, sandy soil to provide shelter and insulation. The pit houses of Shibikashi village were typical of those being built throughout the southwest at about 500 AD. 
But a single, much larger pit, still visible today, already marked the people of Shibikishi as being different from most of their contemporaries. This pit and the canyon itself were to prove central to the technological and social revolution that would eventually occur here and leave its mark for a thousand years. In 1849, a U.S. Army expedition came to inspect the territory newly annexed from Mexico. A few miles east of Chaco Canyon, they came upon an extraordinary sight, the first large-scale stone ruins ever discovered in the United States. The party surveyor, Lieutenant James Simpson, marveled, particularly at the masonry. A combination, he wrote, of science and art, which can only be referred to a higher state of civilization than is discoverable in the works of Mexicans or Pueblos of the present day. Within the canyon itself, the expedition found more great ruins, each with the same remarkable masonry, unlike anything known to exist in North America. At the turn of the century, stories of the wonders to be found in Chaco attracted to the canyon an adventurous rancher-turned-amateur archaeologist who set up camp behind the great back wall of Pueblo Benito, his wife in charge of the kitchen. Richard Wetherill had persuaded New York industrialists to back his expedition. With work crews of Navajos then living in and around the canyon, Wetherill began the task of excavating the great building. But after a few seasons' work, the government shut the excavation down because of accusations it was simply pillaging the ruin. Wetherill, embittered, turned to trading and ranching, and in 1910 was shot to death near his ranch at Pueblo Benito. It was not until 1921 that a National Geographic Society expedition led by archaeologist Neil Judd again took up the task of excavating Pueblo Benito. As the building was opened up, several burials were discovered, usually accompanied by beautifully designed black and white pottery. After three years' excavation, the full extent of Pueblo Benito began to be apparent. Work then began on restoring sections of the great building, which Judd estimated had once contained 800 rooms and a population of perhaps 5,000 people. By 1924, Pueblo Benito was fully revealed. While flying over the canyon a few years later, Charles Lindbergh snapped its picture. Work was then beginning on the ruin called Chetro Kettle, just to the east of Pueblo Benito. On the dig was Florence Hawley Ellis. I came in 1928. I just finished a master's degree at the University of Arizona, and it was exciting to get out of the Arizona area and into famous Chaco Canyon. Living conditions were rough. We were living in a tent village over on the other side of Pueblo Benito. We had to send out for food, because there's no place around here to get your food. And we sent a truck out. When the Chaco wash runs, it really runs. And the truck usually would manage to get stuck in the bottom. The whole countryside here has a lot of clay in it. It would have been good for potters, but it was terrible for people who were driving. <laughs> My main responsibility in the early years here was working up a classification of Chaco and pottery. Because the Chaco pottery had never been classified in a series of types that would show succession through time. So I was supposed to work this material up as best possible. There's a 30-foot dump, or was then, on the east side of Chetro Kettle, and it was famous in the southwest, and people thought there would be centuries of material represented there. I haven't seen that dump for some years, and I'm going right over and look at it again. 